Greetings and salutations, fellow travellers in the moral multiverse. I'm Dr. Chris Bateman, game designer and renegade philosopher, but you can call me Dr. Multiverse. Not so much a time lord as a metaphysical peasant fighting a non-violent struggle to restore the imaginary cosmic balance between the suppressive law of empires and the unbridled chaos of individual freedom. I want to start this episode with the kind of personal experiment that Wittgenstein favoured. As Vicky liked to say, don't think, but look. So let's look, shall we? Here are images from protests that have taken place in the last year or so. As you cast your eyes over each one, you will almost instantly be able to derive what is being depicted, even though what is included in each image is quite slender. And for each of these images, you'll have a reaction, an emotional reaction, or an emotional reaction dressed up as an intellectual one. You will find yourself in support of what you see in some of these images, and unless you're very unusual, hostile towards some of them as well. Supporters of the Black Lives Matter protest have tended, in my experience, to be hostile to anti-lockdown or vaccine passport protests, like the one in Paris shown here. And almost everyone favours only one out of trans activist protests or gender critical lesbian protests. Now, it's perfectly normal that we should take sides, of course. But if we see ourselves as the inheritors of the critical tradition passed on to us from Immanuel Kant, Mary Wollstonecroft and their successors, then our commitment ought to be to equality of all, the driving force behind both the Declaration of Universal Human Rights in 1948 and the civil rights movements of the 20th century. And if we take up this commitment to equality, when we look at these images, we should be able to find at least a scrap of solidarity with all the protests depicted. But we don't, or at least very few of us do. Don't think, but look. Look at the images, but look also at your reactions to them. Where do these reactions come from? In Imaginary Games, the first part of my trilogy for Zero Books, I adapted Kendall Walton's make-believe theory of representation to games and play. Walton says that representative artworks entail prescriptions to imagine. They require us to imagine certain things. But these prescriptions to imagine are underdetermined, such that what we end up imagining entails more than what the artworks can suggest by themselves. Let's look at an example that I hope everyone will be familiar with. The Balrog, a demonic monster from J.R.R. Tolkien's Legendarium, his megatext of tales set in and around the fictional world of Middle-earth. What does a Balrog look like? Like this? Perhaps if you're a relic of a bygone era such as myself, like this. Now let's compare what Tolkien actually says a Balrog looks like in The Fellowship of the Ring. Something was coming up behind them. What it was could not be seen. It was like a great shadow, in the middle of which was a dark form, of man shape maybe, but greater. And a power and terror seemed to be in it and go before it. It came to the edge of the fire, and the light faded as if a cloud had bent over it. Then with a rush, it leapt across the fissure. The flames roared up to greet it and wreathed about it, and a black smoke swirled in the air. Its streaming mane kindled and blazed behind it. In its right hand was a blade like a stabbing tongue of fire. In its left, it held a whip of many thongs. His enemy halted again, facing him, and the shadow about it reached out like two vast wings. It raised the whip, and the thongs whined and cracked, Fire came from its nostrils, but Gandalf stood firm. You cannot pass, he said. Now notice what Tolkien does not say. He does not say the Balrog has wings, which both the movie depictions show. Rather, he says the shadow about it reached out like two vast wings. Indeed, Tolkien says the Balrog is like a great shadow, which is easy to write but difficult to depict. He does not say clearly that it's a giant. B. Jackson always likes to crank his movies up to 11. He says it is of man shape, maybe yet greater, which is not necessarily a comment on the size of the Balrog at all. Apart from the flaming sword and the whip and that it's streaming mane kindled and blazed behind it, Tolkien's description is radically insufficient to determine a definitive appearance for this demon. 
Yet when I mentioned Balrogs, I rather suspect an image appeared to you that was not entirely removed from the two movie appearances of Balrogs I presented to you. Once we have seen a Balrog depicted, it becomes difficult to get back to the openness of description that Tolkien provides us. We become, if you will, primed to see what we have already seen, framed into a way of thinking about Balrogs that is constrained by our prior experiences in a way that someone who had solely read The Fellowship of the Ring would not be constrained. It is the same when we see the photographs of the protests. Taken on their own, all that these photographs prescribe that we imagine is that there were protesters in some place holding some signs. Perhaps the photo hints at where they were. The one outside the Louvre is certainly explicit in this regard. Perhaps the writing on the signs adds additional constraints to what we might imagine. But these particular pictures do not, in and of themselves, prescribe any aspect of our emotional response to these photographs. Rather, our political commitments fill in the gaps in the photographs in the same way that filmmakers had to fill in the gaps left in Tolkien's descriptive prose of the Balrog. In so doing, they not only collapsed the inherent ambiguity of Tolkien's original prose, they also infected everyone who saw those films with a prior image of what a Balrog was. They prescribed, we imagine, something that was not prescribed by the original artwork at all. These intertextual connections, such that no artwork truly stands alone, are an inherent part of how we humans now engage with the world. And as a result, we are all living in different worlds, even though the physical space we inhabit is still the same planet. Indeed, everything on our planet lives in a different world. The world of the squirrel, as I discuss in Wikipedia Knows Nothing, is not our world. And like Thomas Nagel's bat, that squirrel world is fundamentally barred to us. We don't need anything as arcane as echolocation to create the difference that makes a difference here. The way squirrels read trees is something we can come to comprehend in our own terms. But we cannot claim, therefore, to have access to the squirrel's point of view. As Nagel says, what would be left of, uh, of what it was like to be a bat if one removed the viewpoint of the bat? We might also ask what would be left of the left if we removed the viewpoint of the left. I fear we are finding out. What I still tend to call the left, uh, whichever political movements descended from that ragtag alliance of thinkers that sought to transform both tradition and power during the Enlightenment. And if this is indeed what we call the left, then we are currently removing the left from the left. And as such, it will soon be left with nothing. The radical failure of nearly every attempt at social justice since Martin Luther King's death on 4th of April 1968 comes in part from losing touch with what Gandhi and Dr King had clearly understood. That change does not come from defeating the enemy, but from working for reconciliation with those that oppose you. Dr King's activism was grounded in his religion, Christianity, just as was Gandhi's, a Hindu, before him. I will not say that social justice has to be grounded in a religion, but any successful movement must be able to sustain a faithful community somehow. I hope the remaining Marxists still realise this, especially if they've read de Beauvoir and Sartre. You cannot build a community that strives for liberation merely upon common enemies. One way or another, it must maintain its faith in human equality. If instead it embraces hate, it flounders or else becomes locked into eternal, endless warfare. Dr King, drawing against his own faith tradition, said, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. This is the time for reconciliation. This is the time for redemption. This is the time to build the beloved community. Can you imagine an activist today taking this tone? Compare recent remarks from the British Labour Party's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, saying that the Tory government are scum. OK, OK, I get it. The government we have here in our just barely united kingdom are a disaster. But what is the supposedly politically left-leaning Labour Party doing, giving in to the politics of hatred? Likewise, in the United States, the Democrats' hatred of those who vote Republican marks the same kind of failure. If indeed that particular political schism is not ultimately far, 
far worse for everyone. Well, we did some thinking with Tolkien earlier, so perhaps to finish, we could do some thinking with that other great British fantasist of the mid-20th century, Michael Moorcock. In the last part of my Zero Books trilogy, Chaos Ethics, I link up Moorcock's novels to their philosophical connections. On the one hand, the existentialist novels of the 20th century, and on the other, Moorcock's concept of a multiverse. Moorcock's novels are in fact where the physicists acquired their term for parallel universes. But he also uses this term multiverse metaphorically, in a way that lines up beautifully with William James's multiverse or pluriverse, an each form of existence instead of an all form. When we can successfully imagine such an each form of existence, even as just a momentary glimpse, then we find that we live in a moral multiverse. And if we commit to the ideal of equality that emerged from the Enlightenment thinkers, that reality, that plurality, is not a denial of truth, but merely a different way to understand it. We live in different worlds, but we all live in the same multiverse. If you fancy yourself as belonging to the worlds of what was once called the left, if you are committed to the spirit of equality that grew out of the Enlightenment, it is simply unacceptable to cast out those who disagree with you as Balrogs, much less to threaten them or to seek to deprive them of their freedom to speak. It is one thing to stand our ground and cry, you cannot pass to those we oppose. But when you angrily decry, dismiss or even detest those protesters who happen not to align with your prior political commitments, you have abandoned your claim to be striving for civil rights. Balrogs thrive solely in our imagination. Your political opponents, whoever they are, are human, all too human. Eventually, we must reconcile with them or else abandon equality as our ideal. Whatever political freedoms we can win must be for everyone, or else it will swiftly transpire they are for nobody. All I can do is urge anyone who has lost sight of the vital necessity of reconciliation in the struggle for freedom to remember that we are not fighting against the enemy. We are fighting for equality, equality for everyone. And that has to include even those who disagree with us.